lifting up Jesus and opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, the United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. Proverbs 23, in those first, particularly eight verses, speak of a particular kind of situation which we can all get caught up in. I first say salary from the ministry um, or royalties for materials and things. I did business deals on, on the side and still do. Uh, I did, of course, get scholarships and things to go through seminary. But uh, essentially, I've always been a tent maker. Now, like Paul, it was sometimes he made tents, sometimes he was financially sponsored by the church. But I've been a tent maker. Most people in Morio are tent makers. They have secular jobs, the exception being the people who are full-time missionaries in Africa or Philippines or Thailand or other such places, or Israel or other such places. But most of the Morio people, Australia, New Zealand, Britain, America, and so forth, Canada, are tent makers. So we're in the business world. And I have had business, and I still do. And other people in Morio have business and jobs. Being in the world, but not of it. We all have to make a living. Let's look and understand what it's really telling us. These verses are not a polemic against ambition. They are not a polemic against earning a living. They are not a polemic against accumulation of wealth for a godly reason. What is a godly reason? As long as I can take care of my family and myself, I'm content. But there are missions, Christian organizations, charities. I'd like to be able to do more to help. I'd like to have more money so I can advance the work of the gospel. I'm like John Wesley. Make all you can so you can give all you can. However, when you're in the secular world, you're dealing with people who see things differently. And I'm sorry to say, I'm not only talking about unsaved people. I'm talking about some Christian businessmen. I've known Christian business people who are quite Christ-centered and quite philanthropic. But I've known others, they're Christians in church on Sunday, but in the business world, you wouldn't know they were a Christian. I've always pointed out one of my favorite verses, a saying by my favorite rabbi. Where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. My favorite rabbi being Rabbi Yeshua by Yosef Minetzeret, better known as Jesus. Nothing will show someone's attitude towards the things of God more than their attitude towards money. I have had opportunities to deal with two Christian billionaires, I mean literal billionaires, people who have billions of dollars. I will not name either one. One was in the United States, one in, in the Far East, one of the richest men in, in Southeast Asia, probably the, sorry, the richest man in Southeast Asia, biggest property developer in Asia. Uh, another who manages a, uh, he's a major fund manager, a very major fund manager who's now deceased. Anyway, they both liked me. They both liked my teaching. But when it came down to matters of finance, you'd see a shift in gears. One of them had a Catholic wife. He invited me to his penthouse. He liked the teaching. He liked everything. But because of the stance in my books concerning Roman Catholicism, he was afraid his wife would be offended. <laughs> pulls away. We don't want any upset. The other one, because he had money, he thought that he could control things spiritually or should control things spiritually based on his wealth. He who pays the piper calls the tune. So he would dictate theology and things like this as long as he was putting up the cash. 
I could have made certain compromises to have gained access to major funding in my dealings with these kinds of people. They could have opened doors for business opportunities and other things, as well as funding for ministry. But it would have required a degree of compromise. I'm sorry to say that there are people, there are missions directors, there are pastors of megachurches who will compromise on doctrinal issues and on principle because of an ends justifies the means mentality. How much more good I can do with this money, therefore, to get the money I'm willing to shelve these things on the side. This is not to say that we magnify every slight doctrinal issue out of proportion, but there are fundamental issues that have to come before money. I had what at one time had been the most viewed Christian TV program in the United Kingdom on broadcast satellite TV, possibly Western Europe, but certainly the UK. Once they bought in money preachers from America, I bailed out. And I was condemned week after week after week as a Pharisee for refusing to compromise with, with, with being on the air with people like Jesse Duplantis. Money does something. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Not money, but the love of it. But when you have mission budgets and church budgets and... Christian philanthropy and you're trying to help the poor and reach the lost and help the persecuted church, you can come under tremendous pressure to do what you have to do to get the cash. It's not to say you're looking forward to line your own pockets or for your own aggrandizement. You can justify it in your mind on the basis of ministry. It's a danger zone. Now look, we need money. We all have to earn a living. And again, going back to the philosophy of John Wesley, which I agree with, make all you can so you can give all you can. But let's understand what this passage is really warning about in verses 1 through 8. Here is the key. When you sit down with a ruler, consider carefully what is before you. People in positions of wealth and power know about wealth and power. They understand the wisdom of the world. Christians are not to be naive about the wisdom of the world. We are to be innocent as doves, wise as serpents. So on one hand, there is a danger of Christians who become like the world and become worldly wise. You see this in the Pilgrim's Progress. There are Christians who become worldly wise. There are also Christians who become worldly naive. Neither is right. In it, but not of it. Innocent as a dove, wise as a serpent. Remember, people of wealth and power usually have an agenda, unless they're very unusual and very Christ-like. I don't say they don't exist, but they would be few and far between. And again, I've met billionaires who are Christians. Let's look. Put a knife to your throat if you're a man of great appetite. Do not desire his delicacies for his deceptive food. This is speaking by metaphor. It's not simply talking about food, a meal, a dinner, being invited by a wealthy person to an expensive restaurant. Now, of course, in ancient times and biblical times, food was a lot more scarce than it is now and of much more value. People paid a greater percentage of their annual earnings for food sustenance than we do today. Nonetheless, at least in the Western world, nonetheless, it's speaking in a general sense, not simply about eating. You see what these people have, but be careful. If you're a person of great appetite, don't desire what they have. It's deceptive. If it is achieved by worldly means. Do not weary yourself to gain wealth. That is the key. Do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Cease from your consideration of it. 
When you set your eyes on it, it's gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings like an eagle that flies towards the heavens. There is no real temporal security in wealth. Jesus made this clear. You can be rich today and broke tomorrow. I've gone from being lower middle class, upper middle class, to a paper millionaire. Going into the ministry, I went from making a few thousand dollars a week legally, before that it was illegally, uh, but when the Lord called me into the ministry to go to Israel, twice in my life, and no, three times in my life, I had to give up everything. As soon as I got a piece of the pie, I had to give it up in response to what God was telling me to do. The first was when he was telling me to go to the mission field. The second was when he told me to go to seminary. And then the third time was when I resigned my position as evangelistic director of a Pentecostal ministry to the Jews because I wouldn't compromise with the money preachers coming over to Great Britain from America. I lost my job, had a family, had everything. Well, I got rid of our condo in Israel. We gave up everything to go to seminary because I'd only been to college, university before that. I didn't study theology. My original background was science. And then I worked for a big company in America, did extremely well, so well that I gave up a supervisory position and joined the union because the union paid so well. I was making a couple of thousand a week as a kid. I, now, I'd made big money before that illegally in drugs and things before I knew Jesus. But three times the Lord has called me to put it on the table. <laughs> Don't trust it. If riches increase, don't set your heart on it. The attitude towards money is this. Everything we have belongs to Jesus. If you're flat broke, if you're a Christian who is flat broke, consider yourself to be wealthy because you're a co-heir with Christ. You've just won a billion dollar lottery. You've just won the Irish sweepstakes, whatever, but you haven't cashed in the ticket yet. You've got to wait to cash the ticket in. The check is in the mail. You may not have anything in your pocket or in your bank account, but you're a co-heir with Christ. No matter how poor or broke you are, reckon yourself to be wealthy. On the other hand, if you have millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions or even billions in the bank or in business or investment, consider yourself to be broke. You are only a steward of that which belongs to the Lord. Every saved Christian is incredibly wealthy. And every saved Christian is flat broke. It doesn't depend on how much money we have in our pocket, in our hand, or in our bank account, or how much investments we have. Every one of us is a co-heir with Christ. We will rule the world for a thousand years with Jesus in the millennium before entering the new heaven. We are unbelievably wealthy on paper. But the paper is God's paper. It's not like a human investment that can lose value in the, in the in securities index. God's paper doesn't lose value. Every one of us is assured of tremendous wealth. We're co heirs with Christ. Our Father is not broke. On the other hand, if you're doing well financially, you are broke. You don't have a nickel. You don't have a sixpence. Everything we have belongs to the Lord, and he expects us to manage it in a way that's glorifying to him. I'd rather see Christians have money than unsaved people. Just be generous towards the Lord and his work and be led of his spirit what you do with it. Many Christians, even sometimes affluent Christians, lack wisdom, and they give money to bad ministries. I've known people to, to write checks or their wives wrote checks to money preachers and things like this. That the money didn't glorify Jesus. It just went to the coffers of some 
scoundrel, some religious hypocrite who's, who's prostituting the word of God. Be generous towards the Lord and his work, but be led of his spirit what you do with it. Now let's continue. Do not weary yourself to gain it. Do not let the accumulation of wealth or financial success to be the center of your life and focus. God comes first, family comes second, the church and others come third. Then there's issues like possibly the love of country and so forth, but there are things more important than temporal wealth that you can't take with you. With one exception, there is a way to take your money with you. The only way to take money with you when you check out, if the Lord doesn't come first, the only way to take it with you is to give it to the Lord when you're alive. What you give to the Lord and his work when you're alive comes with you when you check out. You give money to missions, to evangelism, to Christian charity, to help the persecuted church, to preach the gospel. You're not giving that money away. You're putting it in a savings account that's going to come with you in God's economy. Don't weary yourself. Don't let it consume you trying to get ahead in the secular business world. Do it as a job, as a livelihood, but don't make it the focus of your life. Cease from your consideration of it. Then it goes on in our dealings with secular business people, particularly those who are not Christian or those who are worldly-minded Christians. Do not eat the bread of a selfish man or desire his delicacies, for he thinks within himself. So he says to you, eat and drink, for its heart is not with you. Everything I've ever read about the American Mafia, and, and I read a book by a brother called Joe Donato once who was in the Mafia, and he became a Christian. And he was a made man. He actually was a, something of a mob boss. And there was another testimony I read. Now, I'm not talking about secular books about the Mafia. I actually worked for the same company where I made all the money with Mario Puzo, the author of The Godfather. I knew his family, who also worked for the same company in New York. Mario Puzo. Uh, nonetheless, uh, what I've read about the mafia, they're like that. They'll give you this. They'll give you that. What do you want? They'll give you some. But there's always a string attached. They want you to take it because now you owe us. <laughs> now you owe us. That is the way the world thinks. That's the way unsaved business people think. It goes on. He thinks within himself. He says, eat, drink. But his heart is not with you. You vomit up the morsel you have eaten and waste your compliment. If you get caught up in playing that game, pandering, to people because of their wealth and the hope of gaining it yourself. It's going to make you sick and it's going to turn against you. In the long term, you will gain nothing. And if you really do love Jesus, he will not allow you to gain anything from doing it in the long term. He will bring his correction into your life and the wealth will grow wings and fly away. Because it's become an idol. If you're not willing to put your money on the table and turn your back on it, it's your money, not the Lord's. If you are willing to put your money on the table and turn your back on it, the money is the Lord's, and he will not turn his back on you. If God wants me to have money, he'll give me money. There's been times in my life I needed money. I had a family. London, England is an expensive city. I went to a seminary Bible college in an expensive suburb of London. I came from Israel, not America. I didn't have the loot. How to get myself through it and support my family at the same time. Kids were little. Don't ask me how I did it. 
I didn't do it. God did it. One way or another, he saw me through it. There's been times we have needed money. We had a case once in Africa that some of you are familiar with several years ago, a number of years ago, with Dave Royal, our mission director in Africa, and myself, we were in Tanzania. And we operated a school for orphan girls, girls ages perhaps um, early teens, early to mid-teens, into their 20s. Now, in Africa, education is a big thing in the third world. And to put on a uniform with a skirt, and it's prestige, it's nice, it's something that means you're on the way. We taught them English, obviously scripture, English, computer skills, and, and, and practical way to make living like dressmaking and things like that. So they got a trade, they got computer skills, they learned English, and they learned the word of God, and they had the uniforms. It was that the practical education in Africa, in the third world, and maybe one or two other things. But we found out something. I was down there, and we were meeting with the girls and talking to them. And because we were Mazungu, the Swahili word for white people, the girls would tell us something they wouldn't tell the teachers. And they said to us, can you do anything to stop the rapes? What? Can you do anything, please, to stop the rapes? They wouldn't tell black people. They'd only tell us because we were white, because of the social stigma involved, particularly with the HIV being so rampant, which is a taboo subject in tribal Africa. This was in the Rift Valley near Mount Kilimanjaro. Pagan tribes, some of the Maasai, were raping the Christian girls going to and from school. I immediately called the headmistress. She was a former Muslim who became a Christian, university-educated woman. And I had every girl interviewed. We had them all tested for pregnancy and for HIV. We had a couple of pregnancies, a couple of HIV positives, whatever. It was, it was a mess. Didn't know what to do. Went to the police the police want bribes to stop the rapes. This is Africa. The only thing we could do was to house the girls at the school in a safe compound and build rendezvous and house them there. Rendezvous is these round little cottage things that Africans live in, uh, tribal Africans live in. I needed forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 yesterday. I needed forty, fifty thousand dollars immediately. Didn't have that money. We had spent too much on the AIDS kids. Our budget was exhausted or nearly exhausted in Africa. What are we going to do? I needed forty, fifty thousand U.S. dollars immediately. I prayed. Dave Royal prayed. We contacted some people. Let's pray. Within 48 hours, I had the money. Jesus gave it to me. I didn't ask for a Mercedes. I didn't ask for a Cadillac. I just asked for the money to build the Ronda Vols to house the girls to stop the rapes. Whenever I needed money, Jesus always gave it to me. We had 200 Christian families in the mountains in Vietnam who the communist government didn't care about because they were a Christian tribe. And they had no food. There were problems with the monsoon and the harvest. 200. They had nothing to eat. They had kids and they, there was almost nothing to eat. They were hungry. How am I going to get tons and tons of rice up to those mountains? We had to get these special trucks that could go on these dirt treks up the mountains and then the, the guys, the men had to carry the rice on their shoulders the last 20 miles up the we got the money we got the money 
Make all you can so you can give all you can. I thank God for the Christian business and professional people who have that kind of money to give, who can put up that kind of cash. Nobody is saying, don't be philanthropic and don't do what you need to do to be philanthropic. Before you can help poor people, the first thing you have to do is not be one of them. But don't compromise doctrine or ethical principles to get it. Don't be like the world to get it. Don't set your heart on it to get it. Don't make the acquisition of it your focus. Even if you can somehow justify it, I can be philanthropic and I can fund missions. I'll tell you something. Going back to my native New York when I was a young guy in my 20s now, my girlfriend, presently my wife, lived in Israel. And a friend of mine who was running the uh, Jews for Jesus branch in New York at the time said to me, you know, maybe you should move to Israel. Maybe you should relocate there. And there was a tremendous battle in my life. I was saying to the Lord, but Lord, there's more Jews in Queens than there are in Tel Aviv. If you want me to evangelize Jews. Look at these checks I'm writing to these Christian mission organizations. Look what I'm look what I can give away, Lord. I couldn't make this kind of money in Israel. I gotta stay here in the <laughs> Oh, I loved the Lord and I wanted to see people saved and I wanted to evangelize Jews and I loved Israel. All of that! And I had a girlfriend who I wanted to marry who was Israeli. Who I met to the Lord. But money had a hold on me. I liked my vacations in Switzerland. I liked going to the 21 Club in Manhattan. I liked the lifestyle. And there was a whole other issue with me because of the associations I had with the rock music industry. I had unsafe friends who made it big in the music business. And I was offered business opportunities in the, in the secular music industry that I turned down because I was a Christian. And so I said, well, the Lord has given me this instead. Now he's taken this away too. <laughs> It was a big battle in my life. Money can do a real number on your head and be a spiritual battle in your life. Remember, the problem is not money. The problem is us. Like anything else, it's the devil, of course. He has a hand in it. He's a back of mammon worship. But it's the world, the flesh, and the devil. Where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. Thank you for your question. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless. Yeah.